Have you ever had to take the lead, but you didn't really want to? <laughs> Front row Joe here, raise his hand. Anybody else? You like, your name is called, you're singled out, and you're like, anybody but me. Everybody been there at one time or another? Yeah. You didn't feel ready, you didn't feel worthy, you just wanted somebody else to lead. Uh, I remember driving home from the hospital after Jack was born and just thinking, what in the world? <laughs> I'm no ready for this than the man on the moon. And uh, being a father is such an adventure and a challenge and it requires everything that we have and probably then some. And uh, it can be challenging and, and awesome and intimidating, all the same thing. Um, but as we take a look at uh, Father's Day, we're going to take a look at the good book for what it has to say about the role of the father in the home. And the Bible talks often about the importance of a father in the home. And so it should be no surprise that study after study confirms this biblical truth. Um, incarceration rates, substance abuse rates. Uh, you can go to any category and you'll find that the importance of a father in the home affects all of those things. And not to diminish the importance of a mother, because mothers are awesome. We would, obviously, we would fall apart uh, without them. Uh, but there's something about the presence of a father that is so critical. Uh, I was listening to a pod, an episode of uh, <clears throat> Focus on the Family, uh, which, by the way, um, is uh, if you don't know about it, you need to know about it. Uh, you can get their app on your smartphone. Uh, if you have a dumb phone, I don't know what to tell you. I guess you could listen, though, on the radio, uh, if you have one of those, Monday through Friday at 9.30 a.m. on WFRN 96.7 out of Albion. It's that Christian uh, station you can listen to. They're on 9.30 a.m. Or you can get uh, through FocusOnTheFamily.com and backslash shows, backslash broadcast. Um, but it's one of the most godly, biblically-based podcasts that you can listen to. They talk about everything under the sun. They talk about dating. They talk about marriage. They talk about parenting. They talk about being single and wanting to be married. They talk about being single and having kids, a single mother, a single father. They talk about blended families. They talk about divorce. They talk about grandparenting. Uh, I mean, you name it, they cover it. And they were interviewing um, author Jared Lopes, who wrote the book, are you ready for the title? Dad Tired and Loving It. Dad Tired and Loving It. Uh, any dads here are tired? Okay. Um, he was sharing from his own personal experience about how his dad left when he was three years old. And he remembers when he was older, he was shooting hoops in the driveway and imagining, imagining that his dad was sitting on the front steps watching him. But of course his dad wasn't there and was not a part of his life at all. And he determined in that moment as a child to be the kind of dad that he never had. I can't speak for all dads, but uh, most of the time I don't feel like I have it together. And yet as men, how often do we act as if we have it all together? Fake it till you feel it, right? But deep inside we wonder if we really measure up at all. Fortunately, Jesus meets us where we're at. He provides what we lack. And that really kind of dovetails with our first characteristic of a spiritual leader in the home. A spiritual leader is forgiven, not perfect. Forgiven, not perfect. Think about it. Some of the greatest leaders in the Bible failed frequently. They weren't perfect. They were far from perfect. They sinned, but they sought forgiveness. They confessed. They repented. They tried to change from that point on. Abraham lied and called his wife Sarah, his sister, to save his own skin. Instead of trusting God that he would take care of the situation, Moses failed, King David failed, Peter failed a lot. Those men confessed, repented, and then renewed their commitment to God, which ended up making their relationship with God even stronger. You don't have to be perfect to lead, just forgive him. In Ephesians, Paul gives us the roles of a husband and a wife, 
And uh, this is God's plan for marriage, Ephesians chapter 5. God's plan for marriage. And there is no plan B. God's plan for marriage is that we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The husband is to be the spiritual leader in the home, but it starts in verse 21 with mutual submission out of reverence for Christ. Ephesians 5.21 And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, before we can really uh, submit to one another, we have to have reverence for Christ. And so, fathers, we have to be in step with God before we can be the kind of husband that we need to be. We need to be in step with God before we can be the father that we need to be. And you say, well, you know, I can't really be the spiritual leader in my home because my wife has been a Christian longer than me. Okay, well, you better catch up then, buddy. We don't take excuses here. There is a significant place for your role in the home as a spiritual leader. Uh, most women that I talk to, um, and this is, uh, I guess, over the course of, uh, you know, almost 30 years in ministry, would be willing to follow a godly, gentle, selfless husband, but absolutely not willing to follow a husband who is uncaring, not present, demanding, dictatorial, or selfish. But ladies, let me say this. Your husband is not perfect. He's not the perfect husband. He's not the perfect father. It was a good time saying then you missed it. <laughs> but if your husband is trying to be the spiritual leader in your home, he's trying, he's making effort, you need to encourage him and support him because a man will thrive in an atmosphere of honor. The number one need of a man is respect. It's respect. Number, number one need of a woman is security. To know that everything is taken care of and that she's loved and cared for and nurtured provided for, and that everything's going to be okay. Men, not so much. We, we want respect. And so that honor will just inflate him, and he'll rise to the station that you would like him to be if it's an atmosphere of honor. You know, we act pretty tough as men, but in reality, our emotions and our confidence is fragile and easily broken. I'm just going to tell you that. We put up a good front, but, but inside we're kind of we're kind of tender. If your man is trying to get it right, but he isn't doing it the way that you'd like to do it, you need to applaud him. If all he does is button up his shirt so it's even, line up the kids in the morning, and he did it again. I don't know how he did it, but he did it again. Just celebrate even the smallest of accomplishments and he will thrive with that honor. Um, for some, for most plants to grow, all they need is a little water, a little sunshine. So give him a little rain, give him a little sunshine. The reality is he's not going to lead spiritually like you would. Um, and here's the reality of the matter. If you criticize him when he's trying to get it right, he's going to quit trying to make it right. That criticism will make him shut down. That's just the thing about men. We're so tender that if we get criticism in something that's outside of our comfort zone and we're criticized for it, even though we're trying, we'll just shut down. Am I, am I right, men? You can nod. Or, okay. I remember uh, when the kids were little, uh, I don't think even Emma was born, but uh, Jack and Luke were like two and four. And uh, she's like, well, why don't you play with the kids on the floor? I'm like, oh, could I break them, you know? And so I did, and you know, one thing led to another, and it sort of escalated, and it started to get more rough, and then eventually somebody cried. And uh, so, you know, she's like, so uh, like a few weeks later, she's like, every time you get on the floor with the kids, they cry, somebody cries. I'm like, you wanted me to do that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm just, so in my mind, this is how a man thinks. Well, I'm just not going to do that again. Because if I'm trying and I'm not doing it the way you want me to do it, I just won't do it. Men, are you with me? Um, front row Joe here. Thank you. You get an A for the day. His name's Don, but. 
I paid him to raise his hand, but uh, <laughs> other than that, we're, we're doing pretty good. So your man is not going to do it the way that you would like him to. And uh, studies have shown that the two, the two of the greatest impediments to a healthy marriage are criticism and stonewalling. And they are somewhat gender specific, and I'm going to make a generalization here. I may step on some toes, but typically men are guilty of stonewalling and women are guilty of criticism. It becomes a vicious cycle. There's criticism. Nag, 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 nag. And so dude gets defensive, shuts down, and stonewalls. He's not going to engage. He's not going to enter into that conversation because he's always wrong. Which only, when he doesn't engage, that only makes the woman want to amp up the criticism because he won't engage in the conversation. He won't open up and make himself vulnerable. Which leads to more stonewalling. And it just... It goes on and on and on. It's interesting because women are physically modest, but emotionally immodest. Would you agree with that? So like, most wives like to change and get dressed without their husband ogling. I could be wrong, but I think that's usually the case. But you get a bunch of women together and they'll talk about everything. I remember one time at Thanksgiving, I walked into the dining room where all the women were, and I was getting going to get seconds, and they're talking about afterbirth. And I was like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm not, I don't want seconds anymore. <laughs> Emotionally immodest, we'll talk about anything. Men are the opposite. We're physically immodest, walking around the house in their underwear, right? <laughs> don't care. Uh, use the backyard as a bathroom, you know, not a problem, right? We don't care. Um, doesn't bother us. But emotionally, we're modest. And we don't like to reveal who we really are because sometimes we don't really know or we're, we have shame. So it's interesting how we're different. So women try to encourage your man when he's trying to get it right, even if he's not getting it right, and he's probably not going to get it right. A real leader is forgiven, not perfect. A real leader is humble, not superior. Humble, not superior. Look at the lifestyle of Jesus. He led with a humble, servant-like attitude. He said things like, he who wants to be greatest must be servant of all. And then John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And every day, husband, every day, father, you've got to lay down your life for your family. And that doesn't mean providing. That doesn't mean going and making money, putting food on the table. That means laying down your life. That means thinking about them, doing for them, serving for them, setting aside time for them, making time for them, being in tune with their emotional needs, talking about spiritual things, talking about the Lord when you have the opportunity and not checking out which we tend to sometimes gravitate to. Being a leader does not mean you say jump and everybody says how high. Being, when you love someone with Jesus style love, you're more concerned about what you can give than what you can get. And one of the biggest things that we can give is our time. In ministry, like many jobs, it can lead to um, divide your time between your obligations and balancing it with your family, right? And sometimes men get that a little bit out of balance. A youth pastor tells a story of a, a time when he was super busy and he had a four-year-old daughter and he came home from the youth event and he, all he had time to do was to grab a quick shower um, and then get back to the church for a teen get-together. And his four-year-old daughter went up to him and wanted a hug. And he said to her, I'm, I'm sorry, honey, but..." but I gotta go and teach people about Jesus. And she said, well, Daddy, when are you gonna teach me about Jesus? Well, sadly, he quit the ministry and he took an eight to five job working in a factory in Detroit so he could be home evenings. Some, some dads who say, I just don't have enough time to be with my family also have time to be on the phone, 
have time to play video games, have time to golf, fish, hunt, or binge net Netflix. Here's the biggest thing. When you're home, be home. Be fully present. I think for dads, it can be easy to be home physically and not really be there, but be present. You can be physically there, but not engaged, and you might as well not even be there. When you're home, be home. A lot of men gravitate to work instead of home and pour themselves into the work. And I think for some, uh, it's about providing. For some, it's about money. For some, it's about status. For some, it's just because they're more comfortable at work because when you go to work, everything's laid out. You know what's expected. You know what you need to do. And you know when it's done. And when you're done, you know whether you did a good or bad job. Being at home is kind of the opposite. As men, we're a little out of our element because we're not geared as relationally as our wives are, so we don't always know what is expected of us, unless we're told, which we need. We don't always know when the job is done, and we often have no clue as to whether we did a good or a bad job, unless we're told. Greater love has no one this than he laid down his life for his friends. So dads, what would you be unwilling to give up for your family? Is there anything that you would choose over your family? We should be willing to drop anything at a moment's notice for our family. Love without sacrifice is not love. So a spiritual leader is humble, not superior. And humility means I'm willing to confess and repent when I've done wrong. Like the, the time when the boys were little, and I asked them to clean up like five times, and they didn't do it, they didn't do it, they didn't do it, and I just lost my gourd. And I grabbed their toys that they were playing with, they, their favorite toys, and I put them out on the porch, and I told them they couldn't play with them ever again. <laughs> I don't know if I said ever again, but it was pretty, I was like, you, you're not going to play with these. And uh, they cried, and I was like, what am I doing here? Never, first of all, never make a threat that you're not willing to back up. And then second, you should always discipline in love and not anger. And so I had to admit to them, I'm sorry, Daddy lost his mind. I'm sorry that I was angry. A spiritual leader is humble. Humble. Humility also means that you welcome the advice of others, especially your wife. Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I can witness to that. I will make a helper suitable for him. God gave Adam a helper because he needed help. He, he was a lost ball in tall weeds. And as husbands, God has given you a helper. You may not always want that help, but you probably need that help. I, I sometimes get defensive when I'm given advice from the Reverend Mother, but I would say 99.9% .9 of the time she is absolutely right. And I need to embrace that and not get my nose bent out of shape and take it as somebody who loves me and cares about me and what was best for me and what was best for those around me and what was best for you. And she deserves my respect to listen to that and embrace it. A spiritual leader is selfless. Selfless. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Talk about laying down your life. The love that Christ demonstrated on the cross was selfless. There was no self-interest at all in Jesus on the cross. He did it in obedience to the Father, his Father, for our benefit. And selfless love means giving, even when you're not getting. Don't give me this, well, my needs aren't being met stuff. Suck it up and serve Jesus. Doesn't matter if your needs aren't being met. You made a vow to your wife. If you have children, you've taken on a sacred task to raise them in his ways. Selfless love means giving when it's inconvenient. 
And most of the time it's going to be inconvenient. And it most definitely means that you're going to have to give up something in order to give. That's what it means to be selfless. So Paul paints the image of a husband and a father, and he points to the greatest sacrifice the world has ever known, the place where Jesus gave his all on the cross for you and for me. And God's word tells us as husbands, this is the kind of love that we are called to, to lay down our life daily. I love this from Oswald Chambers. He says, our notion of sacrifice is wringing out of us something that we don't want to give up, full of pain and agony and distress. The Bible's idea of sacrifice is that I give, as a love gift, the very best thing I have. Isn't that good? It's not what, you're, what it's going to cost you. It's what you are able to give the very best of who you are. So, what do we know about being the spiritual leader? A couple things. The leader sets the pace. How fast or slow is determined by the spiritual leader. And Dad, you're the spiritual pace setter. And men, if we're honest, isn't that a little intimidating? It just goes to show that our family will follow what we do if we seek God with all of our heart. And if it feels out of your comfort zone, get over it. Dive in. Man up. It's the most important thing that you can do for your family. Be the spiritual leader. Be creative. How you lead is up to you and the Lord. Running, skipping, walking, or hopping is all permitted as you lead. Uh, but just lead knowing that you're going to fail at times and knowing that you're going to lead differently than your wife would lead. I remember when uh, the kids were younger, she's like, okay, we need to do these things at bedtime. You know, we're going to pray, and then I've got this... Uh, I got these books that I want to read and da 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 and I'm like, whoa. I, I'm more like fly by the seat of pants guy, you know? All this structure and like we're different, right? But it's the same goal, right? Same goal. And there's some great tools that are out there if you want to have like a quiet time uh, before you tuck your kids into bed. Um, I'm sure you have your own, but here for practical ways that uh, you can lead spiritually. Do you pray and give thanks to God for your food at the dinner table? This teaches gratitude, contentment, uh, practicing the spiritual discipline of prayer. Um, do you ever pray as a family or as a couple or at any other time out loud other than the, the meal table? I like to pray before we pulled out of the driveway for vacation, asking God to bless it for protection, for his presence uh, to be with us. Or when the kids are going uh, to college, that the Lord will bless their semester, um, that his hand will be upon them, uh, that they will be blessed and they will be a blessing to others. Um, praying before everybody leaves the home. Um, if you remember from last week, my cousin Glenn said that every day before they would get on the bus to go to school, he and his brother and his mom and dad would pray together. They would kneel. I was there when they did it every day. And, uh, you know, 6, 6 or 6.30 a.m., we're there by the, the, the sofa on our knees praying, right? Um, do you ever talk about the Lord in everyday ordinary conversation? Talking about creation or talking about a verse that maybe something you see reminds you of that. Moses instructed the Israelites to write his word on the doorpost and the wall so it could ever be before them. And they're walking about and they're talking about. <clears throat> if your kids are out of the house, maybe they're in college or they're on their own, you ask them, hey, where were, where did you go to church last week? Kind of, you know, not interrogation, but just, hey, you know, is this a part of your life? And encourage them to, to find a new church home. Our teachable moments taken when children give them and opportunities rise. <clears throat> if your child lies about something, wouldn't that be a great opportunity to bring in scripture and teach that even if uh, they're not caught in a lie, God sees it, God knows about it, it's still a sin. And that the very foundation of every relationship is trust. And if you don't have trust, you have nothing. Kids have a lot of questions. I don't know if you noticed that, but kids have a lot of questions. 
one of my regrets was that I didn't take the time to answer questions fully or look for opportunities to include the Lord in the conversation more than I did. I also wish that instead of answering them, I would have answered them with a question. Jesus answered questions with questions. It's a great learning tool. I had somebody text me this week a question about tithe, and I was ready to fire off an answer because, you know, get it up, you know, I'm going to answer it, and I'm at the next thing, right? And I stopped, and I said, well, what do you think is the answer? And they said that they answered what I was going to say. And I hope that that answer is stronger in their heart because they had to answer it, and I just say, well, pastor says. Because the Bible says we have to work on our own salvation with fear in front of them. And so it... I'm not discounting the importance of a, a shepherd, but uh, we have to figure out some of those things out. Look for opportunities as they pop up, and they do. And uh, when you fail, own it and confess. And if you failed in some area, don't let that be a prohibitor of you instructing your kids and warning them about the dangers of that. Sometimes when we sin and we have things in our past, we let the devil block us from warning our kids about that because who are we to say? Who's going to tell them if we don't? Right? Who's going to warn them if we don't? A spiritual leader trains and instructs his children. Ephesians 6 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, lead them and <laughs> bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, we spend a lot of time on the part of exasperating, and I don't have to belabor that because dads do that, right? We pull, we prod, we tease, we wrestle. Uh, we're good at exasperating, um, but uh, we shouldn't. I'm going to focus on the second part of that, the training and the instruction. Um, Mark Twain said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. When I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> Fathers, don't leave the discipline and the teaching, the instruction to your wife. You and your wife are a team with shared responsibilities. Um, and I think that the verse 4 only addresses the father, I think, because this comes more naturally to mothers, generally speaking, and fathers have to work at it. And we need to be reminded that our influence at home is of vital importance. Your role in the home is vital. And the eternity of your children hangs in the balance, their souls. I know for me, um, and my dad is here today, my dad was loving and kind. He wasn't perfect. He'll be the first to tell you that. But for me, I can't believe in a God who loved me because I had an earthly father who loved me. And I found it easier to believe and a God who would love me, and I could embrace John 3.16 because that earthly, earthly father who showed me love, even when I didn't deserve it. Being a father is difficult, it's scary, it's awesome, it's overwhelming, it's rewarding, and it's a joyful task. And we want to close our service by opening our altar and asking all the fathers to come forward for prayer. But we want to pray for you, uh, our dads. Will you come forward and 